You know, I, th I thought it was interesting what Philip had to say that uh, how in the world are we going to cover the Beatitudes this morning in this class? And that was one of the first thoughts I had several, uh, well, it was a few months ago when um, asked if I would teach the class. And I always say, you know, there's so many guys that would just, they'd love to do, they'd love to get in there and teach that class and have that opportunity and everything. He says, no, I want you to do that. And so I said, okay, we'll do that this time. And so they handed me this class on the Beatitudes. I didn't tell me what to do with it, didn't tell me how to, anything about handling it. I didn't know what other speakers were going to say. Um, I think as we listened already, we've had it the entire thing quoted to us, the entire sermon quoted to us. We've had other things brought out about it. I was sitting there a while ago thinking about uh, Job and his trials when uh, Wes was talking a while ago, and that in all of that, he didn't sin, and I thought how that ties into some of the things that are said here, and we're going to come to that in, in just a, a few moments, but I call this introduction to blessing, because, you know, we recognize the words in that, don't we, and we'll come to that in just a moment, but if you got your Bible, let's read them over real quick, just to remind ourselves what we're talking about. You may have them devoted to memory, you probably read them thousands of times, we've heard them preached, we've looked at them, but look at Matthew 5, and this is from the New King James Version, and all I... I I haven't quite made it into my Bible. Look at this. I tell you what, this Bible is falling apart. And when it falls apart, maybe I'll get a new version. But uh, continue to use the New King James a lot. And so and, uh, if you've got a different version, may read slightly differently than this. It says in verse, uh, verse 2, Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember that one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Introduction to blessing. Let me give you a little background of my thoughts, and you're probably not interested, but I've got to fill the, the next, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes in here, so we're going to go with whatever I want to think about for a while. When it's your class, we can do whatever you want to think about it right now. I, I was thinking about it was about 1961, somewhere right in there, it was 60, 61, somewhere in that, that range. My father was engaged in a gospel meeting with the Edmund Church of Christ. And for some reason, my mother sent me to be with my father during that meeting. Must not have been school time. I wasn't in kindergarten, first grade, or whatever. But I was sent to be with my father while he was in that meeting. Well, in the 1960s, fathers didn't know what to do with their children, I think. <laughs> I know my dad didn't know what to do with me. But we were in the Edmond area, and so one of the days during the meeting, my father took me to... Uh, a kind of new attraction in the area. One afternoon, he decided to take me to a new attraction in the area, and it was an old, old west kind of place that was fairly new and is known as, I suppose to say as, Frontier City. You may have seen it. Been there a long time. Anyway, it wasn't quite the amusement park then that it is today, and some of you may have been around long enough, and you can recognize that and what it was in its earliest days. And while we were there, we went through several of the things that were there and watched, you know, some of the entertainment that was taking place. But among the things that we did is my father took me to the gift shop, and he told me that we could purchase something for my mother. I didn't have any money. So he was going to have to buy it. So we went to the gift shop to buy something for my mother. Well, I saw all kinds of things that I know she would have loved for me to have. <laughs> <laughs> After we looked at some of the, the gimmicky toys and all the things that were there and had a lot of fun with all that and went, went through that, finally he said, well, why don't you look some, for something she would like? And so 
We finally came over, and I found something I just knew she would love. We found, I found one of those tacky, uh, touristy signs that's cut out of a tree branch or something, you know, and then they've engraved something on it, and I saw it, and it got my attention. I had my dad read some of them to me because I wasn't reading that well yet, but I had him read those to me, and I came across one that really got me, and I just had to have it. Probably didn't cost more than two or three bucks. This is not a replica of it, but that's basically what it said on it. It was one of those round, ugly, tacky, glossy things and everything that you got. And if you've got them on your wall, I apologize, but it's <laughs> still, still tacky. Anyway, and on it was that verse, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. I didn't know much about the Beatitudes. I said, what do I know? I was a little kid. But I love that, pure in heart. And I thought, oh, my mother, that's going to be perfect for her. My dad said, are you sure? And he wanted me to, and I said, no, this is it. And so he finally gave in, and he bought the thing for me. We put it in a bag, you know, and then when I got home, I was so excited about this. And I took that thing, and I gave it to my mother, and bless her heart, bless her heart, my mother hung it on her wall right next to her bed, and it hung there for probably, I don't know, years. It was there for a long time. It was still there when, when I met you, and it's, it's probably there for 20 years, hanging on her wall. I know she had to hate it in a way and love it in another. But every time I'd go into their room, there that would be on the wall, and there was that statement, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I couldn't have told you any of the other Beatitudes at the time, but that one, I loved it. That was my introduction to the Beatitudes as far as I know. Years later, and the next time I, I remember being enamored with the Beatitudes was when I became a freshman in college. The preacher at the college church in Searcy, Arkansas, when I went to school, was Jim Woodruff. Jim was a good preacher, did a good job. And on Sunday evenings, when we arrived in that fall session, on the, on the Sunday evenings, he was doing a series, a series on the Beatitudes. And every Sunday evening, there would be a new poster on the wall, right below the one from the week before, and there it would have the next Beatitude. And that week, we would study that Beatitude. I don't remember much else about it. I just remember I'm stuck on the wall. I remember that's what he preached and took all those weeks. We're not going to take all those weeks to do that. That was in the fall of 1973. I don't know that I spent a lot of time with the Beatitudes then or after that, but how can you not love them? How can you not read them? How can you read them and not love them? I got to say that right. How can you read them and not love them? But there was something about them that just didn't gel with me exactly in the way that they were being presented. And so I'm coming at you with a little bit different perspective. If you're expecting to come in here and we're going to identify each of the Beatitudes, like Philip mentioned, and try to identify each item there and tell about it, I, I can't do that in this time frame, I think. But also, I don't know that we need to do that. There's something else that I want us to talk about. These are introductory verses to one of the greatest messages that's ever been expounded. I was listening and, and thinking about where would, where would I go if I could get in that time machine last night. And I've told classes before, I want to go sit at the feet of Jesus, and this is when. If I want to hear something, I want to go sit at the feet of Jesus when this takes place. If I want to be drawn to a greater spiritual depth, I want to go sit at the foot of the cross and be reminded what it costs to be there. If I want to be reminded of hope, I want to be at the grave when he comes out. I want to be at Mars Hill when Paul is standing there talking to those people. I want to be, I want to be a lot of places, I guess. And wouldn't you have loved to be in the boat when Peter got out and walked on the water? There are a lot of places I'd like to be and be near Jesus. But this is one of them, one of the most important. 
And in these introductory verses, the message of Jesus, there's some of the best recognized of Jesus' orations. Some of the things that stick in our minds, partly because it's repetitive. It's one of those listing things like we see throughout the Bible. We've got things like Ten Commandments here. We've got, we've got the things that God hates. We've got so many lists throughout the fruits of the Spirit, works of the flesh. We can go through and find lists and lists and lists, a time for this, a time for that. You can find all kinds of lists in the Bible. And sometimes we turn this simply into a list of things. Again, I think we do a disservice when we just make it into a list. They're beautiful. It is a list, but it, they are more than a list. There's a kind of wonder associated with them, and it leaves us to question, and, and maybe we'll address just slightly some of that this morning. It leaves us to address what was Jesus trying to give us? What was he trying to say to us in this beginning? And then what are we supposed to do with them? What are we going to do with these things? Read them and think they're beautiful? That's great. As we begin, we look at it and we say, have I got your attention? You know, if you, you ever study speaking, you recognize that you got to get started. you got to get people's attention. you got to get them thinking about what you're going to say. you got to get them listening to you for a moment. And there are all kinds of distractions. And today, it's easier in some ways and harder in others. We are an entertainment-driven people, and so sometimes we just got to get hold of people's attention. Jesus had their attention, and when he started you had to know they're enwrapped with what he's got to say. The unique nature of it, the beauty of it, and some of the other things that have been dressed in other places, but the idea he began strong because the audience can be won or lost in those first few lines that you're offering him. Consider some of the speeches that we hear in a secular vein over time. You think about Abraham Lincoln standing up four score and seven years ago, and they didn't even like his speech. But it Think of how we see it today. And so many others that have come and gone through the, through the ages. But if we look very carefully, just prior to the beginning of his words, what, is he, what does it say? He opened his mouth and he taught them. He had something to say, something he wanted to get across to them, something they needed to understand. There was something there. His words and his intention were intentional. He wanted them to know something. There was something he wanted to give them, something he wanted them to hold on to. His words were chosen for their effect. They were chosen for their understanding. He wanted them to hear and understand. And he begins each of these lines with how we use it as blessed or blessed. Growing up, we always said blessed. I don't know, some places say blessed, some say blessed. I had a teacher that always said blessed. I, I thought they were saying it wrong when I heard blessed. But now, blessed, blessed. Makarios. Just wanted you to know I could pronounce a word. And it's the idea of being beatified. We sometimes hear about that when we hear about the Roman Catholic Church trying to make a new saint out here and so forth. And, and we may look at that and we may scoff in some ways at that. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to honor or bless some individual in a very special way. That's where that idea comes from. To make blissfully happy. Several years ago, there were those who would look at these and they would say, Bless, bless, bless. Happy are those, happy are those, happy are those, happy are those. And I always thought, happy, happy. Happy are you when you're hungry? Usually I'm not happy when I'm hungry. I'm happy when I've got that cheeseburger halfway down. That's when I'm happy. <laughs> we think about the word happy doesn't fully carry it, but blissfully happy, fulfilled, joyous in that way. And so we look at them, we're drawn to them, we're attracted, they're beautiful, he's got our attention, and we're listening, and then we've got the idea that a beatitude is. What is it? What is it? As I said, I sometimes think we've fallen a little bit short in that, not always, and you may have it all figured out and everything, and so this is redundant in that way. Some will say it is the attitude that we ought to have, be attitude. Have this attitude. Have this attitude of what? Have this attitude of being 
humble in spirit, have this attitude of mourning over sins, have this attitude of being submissive to authority, have this attitude of being desirous of, of good things, have this attitude of being ge genuinely generous when wronged, have this attitude to be absent of any deceit or guile, have this attitude of being non-combative and even of accepting persecution or even being abused like so many before you righteous people have been before you. <coughs> Be happy about that. I'm not sure that's exactly what Jesus was saying. And I'm not sure we want to look at this and say, well, this is, uh, this is exactly what he's getting at. Are there good attitudes within this? Yes. To be humble of spirit. To be sad over sins that might be in our lives or someone else's life. To be submissive to authority. These are all good things. We can look at those and we say they're good things. But the idea, shall I go out and seek to be persecuted in order to fulfill it? We might even look at it and say sometimes they are seen as measurements of whether you are being a spiritual person, a Christian, a follower of Christ or not. If you're not, then these things are not going to show up in your life. You're not going to be mournful. You're not, you're not going to be humble of spirit and so forth. I'm not sure that's what Jesus was getting at here. That attitude, I think, comes a little bit like from what Wes was talking about in the previous section, uh, session when he, he says, we make it into this list of things we've got to get done. I don't think Jesus was talking about a list of things we've got to get done. If it becomes that, then we just, what is it, Bing, Bill Ingvall says, here's your sign. I got my sign. Or the old song said, sign, signs, everywhere are signs. Well, I got that. got it here, got it here. I know what, God, I've got the signs. I'm not sure that's what Jesus was getting at fully here if we go to the heart of it. Again, you look at it and say, yeah, there are qualities I want to have in my life. Absolutely. Very good. But what was Jesus saying to us? Note that in the conclusion of this introdu these introductory verses, Je Jesus turns it from the general, blessed are those, to blessed are you. Making it a very very personal statement. Generalizing, yes, blessed is anyone, but blessed are you. Look at your life. He brings it home and he says, look at your life and where you are and what's going on in your life. Because I believe Jesus was trying to identify here are real, here are real situations of life. That's not moving. There we go. Because people, you and I included, recognize we have very real situations of life. See, now, last Sunday morning, whoever your preacher was, except at Southern Ridge, uh, last Sunday morning when your preacher got up and he preached, you thought, well, that was great for them. I already knew this stuff. I'm already good. And there's a whole lot of truth to that. Because I think, I look at this. Who comes out here on a Saturday morning but people who are devoted, desirous, good folks. You bet. Most of them sitting in the pews on Sunday morning. Desirous, good people. They don't need to be hammered and kicked. Blessed. Blessed are you. And Jesus points it, makes it very personal because these people are living in real situations of life. You know what's going on in your life. And you recognize that life, you've lived long enough, you recognize life is not just a, a sweet-smelling rose garden. Another song. Never promised you a rose garden. That's not what our life is about. That's not what fills our life. Our life is ups and downs. It's good things, bad things. It's laughter and tears. It's, it's so many things that go on as we learn it and we grow. And how many of you have gotten to a point in life you said, man, this is exactly what I thought life was going to be? Most of us look at life and say, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see it coming at all. And even if you saw something about it coming, you didn't know it was going to be like it was. Aren't I right? I should tell you this, and then I better hurry on. But when I was a, when I was a young boy growing up, we would drive through Oklahoma City. We were living in Tulsa in the green country in the beautiful part of the state, not the wasteland that is around here. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Growing up in Tulsa, and then we'd have to travel to West Texas to vid visit family. And so we'd come right through Oklahoma City, and, and every time we'd come through, I would say, I never, never want to live in Oklahoma City. <laughs> Several years ago, I told my wife, the Lord must have a great sense of humor. We've lived and worked in Oklahoma City for the last 36 years. And he won't let me out of here. I keep trying to get out, but he won't let me go. No, we love it here, and we, we do. But we don't know where we're going to be. We don't know what we're going to do. We don't know how things are going to unfold. We think that if we do this and we'll get things right, everything will flow this way. But it doesn't always work that way. I remember the day that my mother came into my house and sat down across the table from me. We were headed to an anniversary gathering for some other people. She sat down. She said, I might as well tell you, I've got a tumor. That was my mother's way of approaching things. Well, you know, a couple of years later, she's passed away from that as a result. But you're thinking, I didn't see that coming. There's some things we do see coming. And even when we see them coming, we don't recognize the blessing that's in them always. We just struggle with them. That's why I'm saying situations of life are very real. We have circumstances of our own making. We have circumstances that are beyond our control. And the, the most certain thing we have of life is its uncertainty. James says, what is your life but a vapor? It's affected by anything that happens. Chapter 4. It's a vapor. And so Jesus makes a list. He makes a list. And if we look at the list, we recognize these are not all prized attributes of life. How many of you got up this morning and said, I want to go, on, go and find somebody to persecute me. I want to find somebody who's going to say all manner of evil against me. I want to get up this morning and I want to be hungry. Well, I know it's hunger and thirst for righteousness, but still. How many of you got up this morning and said, you know, this would be a good day to mourn? We don't do that. There are great qualities here. I understand that. You do too. But not our all prized attributes that we want to carry in our life. These are qualities that we, we recognize. We know what they are. And they are common occurrences in people's lives. I don't think Jesus was trying to cover every base. I think like so many lists that we find in the Bible of characteristics of people, I don't think he was trying to cover all the things that life could be. He's just saying, here is life. Here's where people are. Here are things that are going on in your life. And some of them will be things you like, and some of them will be things you'd rather not face. And being as human as we are, as we look at it, we want the blessing without the problem. We want the benefit without the work. So what is it that Jesus is saying? What can we get out of this? And uh, what is he saying here? There we go. God has something for your situation. He's saying there's a blessing. God has something to give you. Paul says in Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, there's a reason Christ came into the world, to save sinners of whom I'm chief. This is a worthwhile saying. He says, God has something to give you. But one of the problems is sometimes we just don't see the value in what God has. And that's difficult. Sometimes as Christians, very faithful Christians, we still don't always see the value in what we can find and what God has for us. We don't see that. Augustine said said God is always trying to give us good things, but our hands are too full to receive them. Maybe you would think about Matthew 19 and the parallels of that, of that rich young man who comes to Jesus, what good thing might I do to inherit eternal life? Well, keep the law. Observe the law. I've done this since I was a youth. What then do I lack is the, the gist of his discussion. Jesus says, go sell, give to the poor, come follow me, treasures in heaven. Beautiful passage. And what does the young man do? He came with a request and he walked away without accepting the answer. Or at least following through with it. The rich young ruler and many others failed to see the value of what God, through Jesus, 
would give in comparison to what they already have. I had a friend that used to come by the office every now and then. In fact, we coached baseball, a little bit of soccer together many, many years ago when the, the kids were young and so forth. And on, he would stop by the office and he, he'd, say, he'd say, I know I don't come to church, but God knows I'm busy. Now, you can scoff at that, you can laugh at that, but how many Christians have made parallel, if not exactly the same, excuses for not doing what they know God wants them to do and have in their lives? I'm not trying to be critical. Yeah, I am. Uh, there at the point, I just wanted you to keep listening a little while longer. Just say, okay, that's not for me. And the rich young ruler walks away and says, that's not for me. Yeah, he walked away a little bit sorrowful, but that's not for me. So back to the sermon, back to the Beatitudes, back to the people who are sitting on that hillside with Jesus that day. They had been looking for someone who had answers. There's a reason why they came to listen to Jesus. They were there for a purpose. They were there to accomplish something. They were there because they wanted Jesus to have something for them. And he gave them something. He knew what they were there for. They didn't maybe fully understand, comprehend everything that they were looking for there. Yeah, they were looking for a savior. They were looking for a redeemer. They were looking for someone to give them this kingdom. They'd heard this message of this kingdom of God's at hand. They're ready to throw off Rome. They're ready to do away with those arbitrary leaders that they had on their own. They wanted something, and Jesus seemed to be unique, and they came and they listened to Jesus. They wanted something different. You know that last line as we were thinking last night. He taught them as one having authority. That's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear something that got to them deep, that got hold of them, and they could recognize this had something. And Jesus offered them in the very beginning of this as we read the beautiful, beautiful statements that are there. We find there is some rich depth to each one that says, wherever your situation lies in life, God has something for you. Notice how each contrast is laid out there. You're dealing with this. God's got this for you. You're dealing with this. God's got this for you. You're struggling and mourning. God's got comfort for you. You're hungry. God's got that spiritual food you need. As you go through this, you find that every time God's got a blessing. And I want to tell you something. When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, when you look at the whole gist of the thing, what does it tell you? God has something for you. I believe the sermon comes to a pinnacle peak at verse 21 of chapter 7 when he says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what does it say? But he who does the will of my Father. All of this comes back to God's got something for you. You've got to want it. Rich, concise blessing. They had been looking for someone who had the answers. And as they were there that day, and don't you wish you'd been there right there with them? Yeah, man, that'd have been great. They wanted Jesus to be the one they wanted. So, where do we go from here? What do we get out of this? That's great for them. They were there. What do we get out of this? I know. We're reading it. We can see it. What we can get out of this is we can get a great memorable piece of Scripture. And we get Tim to come and quote it for us and enjoy every bit of it. It's beautiful as literature and inspiring as information. We can get that out of it. Or we can learn. We can learn that every situation in life is an opportunity for blessing. Hard to see sometimes, isn't it? Hard to see a blessing when you're dealing with, when you go to the doctor and he says, listen, I can't do anything about it. I can't fix it. No surgery is going to take care of this. No treatment is going to take It's hard to see a blessing in that. When the finances have gone down the tubes and you see no hope, no work, nothing available to change that, it's hard to see a blessing in that. 
There are times in life that it's very hard to see any real blessing out of what you're going through. And that's when trust is really challenged. Don't you know those disciples of Jesus were wondering what good is in this when they took him away, when they tried him, when they crucified him, don't you know they were saying, what good is in this? It had to be. Every situation in life is an opportunity for blessing. We can read great stories and we get inspired by them. We think about Paul and Silas in the prison singing and, and, and things like that. We can, we can think about uh, different situations, the shipwreck of Paul, things that happen. We can, we can read so many events that transpired and say, what good is in this? And then we see the blessing. But it's hard to see it for ourselves. Because that means we need to see beyond the moment and whatever our situation may be. We, we tend to focus where we are on what's going on in our lives. In our moments of joy, we're excited. But in those moments of struggle, we may believe, yeah, in the morning it's going to be better. But it's hard to get through that night, isn't it? When our oldest little boy was, was four weeks old, I had to have surgery. And that, that threw a couple of young parents off balance. And everything pretty pretty quickly, and it turns out it really wasn't that life threatening a uh, uh, surgery or anything like that. But when you when you're young and you got a, a little four week old baby, and that baby's having to have surgery, and you're far from home, and we were we were in Columbus, Ohio, and having to have surgery and and all, and I'm I'm standing in a, a hospital room at 2 o'clock in the morning, watching traffic go by on the highway out there and thinking other people's lives are going on and mine's in misery. My baby's going to have surgery tomorrow. Hard to see much value in that, isn't there? Of course, he's nearly 40 years old now, and I'm really wondering about the value of that, but that's another story <laughs> we'll have to share another time. But it's hard to see beyond those difficult moments. You know them, you've got them, and you deal with them in your lives. Sometimes they seem like they're going on and on for lengthy periods of time, and it's hard to see beyond those moments. We need to see beyond the moment, whatever the situation may be, because we are reminded, and Jesus is trying to tell us here, the kingdom of heaven is worth, that is all that it goes into obtaining it. He's calling for them to trust him and believe in him to see beyond where they are and what they're dealing with, to see that God has great opportunities. They had a history. We've got it laid out for us, and we can read it. There is a history of God. In every case, God has taken care of his people. The kingdom of heaven, the life that is in him, the association that we have, the relationship that we have with God and even with one another is worth all that goes into obtaining it with great effort, Jesus talks about. The kingdom of heaven is worth all that goes into it and the obtaining of it. And then one more. We've got to believe God has something great to give us. And we should strive to receive it. As I said a while ago, I like that quote from Augustine. He had something to give us and our hands were too full to receive it. Some of you can remember when you were children. Some of you are far too old for that. But uh, you remember when you were children and you didn't always like what your parents gave you. You know, there were meals I sat at home at the table that my mother cooked, and she was a good cook. And there weren't very many, but there were meals that I didn't want to eat. Some days I'd walk, walk in the house after school, come in the house, and I could smell the cabbage cooking. <laughs> and you may love cooked cabbage. And that's your problem, not you. <laughs> but it doesn't smell good when it's stewing in the pot. And I walk in and think, oh, no. How can I be anywhere else? Please. I usually couldn't, and I'd have to sit down, and I'd eat that cabbage. You know what? I'd love to walk in and eat that cabbage today. 
hard to see the blessing at times. We should strive to receive what we have before us. The rich young man walks away, didn't get what Jesus was trying to give him. So many of those that were close to him saw him and they missed what he was offering to them, missed what he was trying to hand them, and they what they do? They put him on a cross, but they just wouldn't receive what he had. And so looking at these Beatitudes, this beginning, this introductory part of this, this great message, Jesus is not pointing to a, a self-indulgent high. He's not saying, hey, you're dealing with this? God's got this for you. Feel good. It's not a self-indulgent high. What he was trying to offer and trying to get across to them and to you and to me is there is a meaningful opportunity for us to be blessed. We've got a wide range of ages in here today. There's a meaningful opportunity wherever we are in our lives to be blessed. So from these introductory blessings and I'm going to wrap it up from these introductory blessings through the the rest of this great message. Jesus presses the meaning of what we can be if we realize, if we pause and realize, if we stop and think, God has something great to bless our lives. It may be that you've sat across the table or chair or held a hand with someone near you and, and thought, why in the world is this happening to us? That's pretty natural, isn't it? I've done it. Maybe we all have it someplace along the, the way. Sometimes we know why. Sometimes we know we deserved it. Sometimes we wonder, why in the world is God letting this happen to me? And sometimes it takes a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade to figure it out. Why in the world did this happen to me? And you stop and think. I was sitting with a friend not long ago. It had suffered some great loss. And I said, do you look back and regret the things and the choices you made in life? He said one of the wisest things to me. It wasn't told me to just shut up. That wasn't it. (laughs) No, he said, we wouldn't be where we are if it were not for the things that have happened and the choices we've made in our lives to this point. Thank God for all the choices and all the circumstances that have happened in our lives. Jesus said, blessed. Blessed. 